The Capitalist Unconscious, Marx and Lacan by Samuel Tomsek. This is part two of chapter four. From the Master's Discourse to the University Discourse. When Lacan attempted to theorize the consequences of May 68, he started with the university reform, with which de Gaulle's government responded to the demands of the students. Here, a symptom of a more general function of knowledge in capitalism could be detected. Its mobilization as a means of fabrication of the capitalist form of subjectivity, as the formula of the university discourse indicates. Lacan took the alliance of workers and students seriously, claiming that the student's task within the system consists in progressively assuming the position of the subject of science. However, in the capitalist universe, this subject knows only the commodity form, which turns it into a quantifiable and measurable labor power. Given this production, it seems logical that the revolutionary students identified with the proletariat. Lacan, however, corrected their intuition. If they search on that side, they may find that with my little schemas, they can find a way of justifying that the student is not displaced in feeling a brother, as they say, not of the proletariat, but of the lumpen proletariat. The students thus form a heterogeneous, passive, and disorganized group, not the position of the subject of value, but that of the, ob of the object, which still needs to become the laborer. Here it says, see image three, which was like that last one, I think on page 364. In their revolts, they were not aware of the actual role they play in the reproduction of capitalism. And the first to collaborate with this right here at Vincennes are you, for you fulfill the role of helots of this regime. You don't know what that means either. This regime is putting you on display. It says, look at them enjoying. Lacan again draws the attention to the objectification of students, the vector S2A, -A, whereby the highlights, whereby he highlights the function of surplus jouissance that pertains to the object A. Combining the Marxist and the psychoanalytic perspective, we can conclude that the student is both the social embodiment of surplus jouissance and of surplus labor. But why is he now compared to the helot? In ancient Greece, helots were a particular um, social class that consisted of subjugated populations of the territories occupied by Spartans. Their actual social situation was very much comparable to slaves, with the exception that they were not bought and sold. Once conquered, they were forced into labor for the free citizens of Sparta and could be mistreated and killed without persecution precisely because they were not considered property, unlike the slaves. With this characterization, Lacan makes a rather unusual move, because he implicitly draws an analogy between the ancient helots and the capitalist lumpen proletariat, both of them being the wretched of the world, social outcasts, which can be mistreated because they are considered to be subjects of jouissance, objects which are forced to carry out surplus labor. The students are comparable to the helot and the lumpen proletariat as far as they are also fetishized as subjects of jouissance, but this is where the parallel ends. For unlike the other two historical figures of the subject of jouissance, the students are obliged to engage in a formative process, to work on themselves in order to become the subject of value and enter the market of knowledge. In this formative process, Lacan envisages the main link between capitalism and the university, and more generally, between capitalism and science. In autumn 1968, the Experimental University Center, soon thereafter named University Paris um, 13, was created in Vincennes, the unconventional character of which was a novum in continental Europe. Its experimental side consisted in interdisciplinary programs but the actual novelty was the credit point system, which adopted the Anglo-American model of the valorization of knowledge. The French expression for credit points, unité de valeur, unit of value, stands at the center of Lacan's attempt to tackle the shift that structured the old continental university, whose model was the Humboldt University in Berlin, in accordance with the capitalist market. 
the credit point, the little piece of paper that they want to issue you, is precisely this. It is the sign of what knowledge will progressively become in this market that one calls the university. The transformation of the university into an enterprise certainly signals the commodification of knowledge. But this is not the object of Lacan's concern. Behind it stands a more fundamental shift in the relation between knowledge and power, which dates further back into history. Um, as already said, Lacan's formula of the university discourse envisages the structural compatibility of capitalism and science, the foundation of capitalist power relations, what Foucault called power knowledge, on the social implementation of the modern episteme, which amounts to the production of capitalist subjectivity. Lacan's placement of the subject in the position of the product signifies both the scientific isolation of labor power in natural bodies and the consequent quantification of subjectivity, as well as the political economic fabrication of homo economicus, no less a product of the social implementation of a knowledge rooted in the imperatives of capital. In the end, the truth of the political economic hypostasis hypostasis of private interest and social egoism is the abstract interest of capital, the tendency towards permanent self-valorization. There is, strictly speaking, no private interest. Behind every apparent private interest of individuals lies the structural imperative of capital itself. Subsequent developments have revealed an additional aspect of this total integration of the education system into the reproduction of capitalism. The privatization of universities amounted to the proliferation of student loans, which immediately turned the education process into production of indebted subjects. From this perspective, the university has become the microcosm of the more general capitalist tendency to ground economy on indebting. The Italian post-workerist philosopher Maurizio Lazzarato recently argued that in financial capitalism, the relation between the creditor and the debtor replace the old antagonistic relation between the capitalist and the laborer. Though this may seem to be the case, one cannot overlook that both are, all, are already at work in Marx's reinterpretation of primitive accumulation. Marx shows that appropriation through dispossession, which creates on the one side the owners of capital and on the other side the owners of labor power, and the historical genesis of national debts, which transforms entire populations into indebted nations, are two interdependent faces of the same process, which injects the asymmetry between capital and labor power in the inequality between the creditor and the debtor, and vice versa. Lacan's discussion of the student's status recalls the central thesis of the political economic tale of primitive accumulation, according to which the indebted subject is born out of jouissance, those who labor stand in debt, which signals their past excessive enjoyment. The formula of the university discourse, too, associates the birth of this indebted and laboring subject with surplus jouissance. What needs to be added here is that the extraction of the subject, labor power, from jouissance presupposes an epistemic intervention, the ordering knowledge, to quote once more the passage where Lacan brings up this point, something changed in the master's discourse at a certain point in history. We are not going to break our backs, finding out if it was because of Luther or Calvin, or some unknown traffic of ships around Genoa, or in the Mediterranean Sea, or anywhere else, for the important point is that on a certain day, surplus jouissance became calculable, could be counted, totalized. This is where what is called the accumulation of capital begins. Primitive accumulation is a logical event that unites three important aspects. First is the already mentioned shift in the relation between power and knowledge. The efficiency of capitalism is grounded on the permanent scientific revolution and innovation, a cumulative regime of knowledge, and no longer exclusively on raw power relations like feudalism or slaveholder societies. As an immediate consequence of this shift, the social implementation of modern scientific knowledge rationalizes the surplus object, which antiquity and Christianity still mystified, precisely by making it calculable and countable. This too is the achievement of the modern credit system, 
through which the capitalist social link is grounded on the creation of profit out of indebting. Because of this social transformation, the prosopopoeia of the regime and its advocates could indeed be capital owes you nothing, together with the implicit conclusion that you owe yourself to capital, since everyone as labor power assumes the position of the debtor. This is the point of the third aspect of primitive accumulation, the birth of the capitalist subjectivity out of the rationalization of the surplus object. As Lacan's formula indicates, the subject has to join knowledge, the vector dollar to S2, through which capital exercises its insatiable demands. The reason why the student's position nonetheless importantly deviates from the ancient helot and the modern lumpen proletariat, or rather represents their capitalist displacement, lies in the specificity of object A. The object A should not be mistaken for other forms of surplus object that Lacan discussed in the various stages of his teaching related to antiquity and the Middle Ages, since, since they presuppose entirely different social social contexts. The mathematization of surplus is accompanied by the foundation of social links on the fetishization of the object. Marx made this point by saying that in capitalism the social relations between things replaced relations between men. To repeat, this does not mean that social relations became alienated and mediated through capitalist abstractions. It merely suggests that the fetishization of objects absorbed the fetishization of persons. Consequently, Lacan discusses Agelma and Das Ding exclusively in relation to the fetishization of persons in the ancient and the feudal discourse of the master. Alcib Alcibiades, fetishi Alcibiades's fetishization of Socrates as the master of knowledge, Agelma, addresses an object in Socrates, a treasure that makes him worthy of desire. The troubadour's fetishization of the lady of the serfs, fetishization of the king, Das Ding, displays a different topological placement of the object. Now the surplus object is transcendent, an unreachable and sublime entity, which makes of the lady and the king social embodiments of the thing. Yet in both cases, the surplus is a positive quality, which stands outside the sphere of exchange. Object A, by contrast, is a surplus that emerges out of the system of exchange and becomes the more overwhelmingly present, the more it is embedded in quantification and mass production. In capitalism, object A becomes the defining feature of every commodity on the market and makes the exchanged objects appear as vessels of surplus value. With the inauguration of the university discourse, the master becomes irreducible to concrete embodiments, inaccessible, invisible, and abstract. Unlike the master's discourse, in which the alienated subject occupies the position of truth and is dependent on the master signifier, in the university discourse, the relation between the subject and the master, now transformed into a labor power and capital, is interrupted. The subject joins the apparatus of knowledge that represents it in the production process and is thereby disarmed of its ability to act. What is striking and what no one seems to see is that from that moment on, by virtue of the fact that the clouds of impotence have been aired, the master signifier only appears even more unassailable, precisely in its impossibility. Where is it? How can it be named? How can it be located other than through its murderous effects, of course? Denounce imperialism, but how can this little mechanism be stopped? The university reveals the truth of the master, its headlessness, and decentralization. In other words, when the subject assumes the places or the place of product, resistance to the master turns automatically into a constitutive component in power relations. This is the kernel of the non-relation between the creditor and the debtor, which, to refer again to Lazzarato, neutralizes the antagonistic oops, neutralizes the antagonistic tension in the contradiction between capital and labor power, and introduces a more radicalized and abstract regime of domination through a multitude of small masters, S2, bankers, bureaucrats, experts, academic networks, 
professional politicians, and so on, which all ex exercise the structural imperatives of capital. <clears throat> <coughs> Freudo Marxism and the sexual revolution of the late 1960s and 1970s met this deadlock of decentralized power, freeing sexuality from cultural censorship, censorship and oppression did seem to challenge the old cultural institutions, but it also opened up the terrain for new forms of exploitation and new institutions of repression, which assumed the appearance of liberators. The liberal form of the repression of sexuality is repression through commodification, where the antagonistic and non-relational aspects of sexuality, what psychoanalysis calls castration, is removed from the picture. <clears throat> Neoliberal ideologies have indeed adopted the political parole of the liberation movements, spontaneity, flexibility, and multi-stability. Neoliberalism no less departs from what Foucault criticized as the repressive hypothesis. The market and financial abstractions are said to be endowed with creative potentials, which need to be liberated by creating the political, economic, legal, and final subjective conditions under which the presumed rationality of the market can engender value. The necessary condition for liberating these hypothetical creative potentials is deregulation, austerity, and restriction of historically obtained social rights. Spontaneity and vitalism, this is the general spirit of financial capitalism. The inauguration of this new spirit cannot mean, however, that we are dealing with an entirely new logic of capital, but that capitalism has succeeded to deploy the essence of the master, making the imperatives of capital more rooted in social and subjective reality and its spectral character omnipresent. This development has immediate consequences for labor, which is metonymized to the utmost and pushed into precarious conditions, as the distinction between employment and unemployment is abolished. Herein lies the continuity between the student and the proletarian, in the sense that the student has to engage in the process of self-proletarianization. The revolutionary students of the 1960s identified with the laborers because they were aware that they share the same unbehagen, discontent in capitalism as the laborers. The unease of the studied is, however, not unrelated to the fact that they are nevertheless requested to constitute the subject of science with their own skin. The infamous credit point lies at the heart of this process once again. Its achievement is the reduction of all life to an element of value. Lacan illustrates this reduction with Pascal's wager, in which he recognizes the main feature of modern morality, renunciation of jouissance, and the emblematic insight into the spirit of capitalism, grounded precisely on the extraction of the surplus object from this new moral ground. In his, fragment, or in his fragment on wager, Pascal engages in an imaginary dialogue with a libertine who questions the existence of God. The wager thereby addresses a double problem. Behind the question whether God's existence can be proven or not, there is a more fundamental dilemma, whether there is a God at all. The logical demonstration is counteracted by the logic of gambling and probability. Pascal writes, If you win, you win everything. If you lose, you lose nothing. Here there is an, an infinity of infinitely happy life to be won. By renouncing the life in jouissance, the libertarian can gain life in surplus jouissance. This is a pitalism at its most speculative. No wonder that Lacan would see in Pascal the most accurate and abbreviated expression of the essence of capitalism. The modern master renounces jouissance and profit in order to create more jouissance. Or, correctly, he demands renunciation from all in order to create profit for some. Marx came to the same conclusion. A bad capitalist wastes his profit for his personal enjoyment, or keeps it jealously for himself. He has a naive understanding of jouissance, confusing it with pleasure in spending and consumption, while a good capitalist knows that jouissance is irreducible to pleasure, and can only be extracted from risk management, indebting, and speculation. But there is more. What in Pascal seems to be a groundless, unfounded, and contingent wager, in fact, concerns the function of science in the globalization of capitalism. 
And it is thus that for a science so well-founded on the one hand, and so obviously triumphant on the other, things happen that land us on our feet again and bring us into contact with what, with what follows, from the fact that the pure and simple command, that of the master, is substituted at the level of truth. Don't think that the master is always there. It's the command that remains, the categorical imperative, keep on knowing. There is no longer any need for anybody to be present. We have, as Pascal says, all embarked upon the discourse of science. In order to wager, no God is needed. The wager, as Pascal persistently repeats, is imperative. The libertine must wager whether God exists or not. What does this have to do with science and capitalism? In order to wager, precisely science is needed, a science mobilized for the production of waste material, for permanent revolution of the means of production, and last but not least, for the mathematization of probability, which would give insight into the presupposed rationality of the god of economists, and thereby finally prove its positive existence. The libertine would then turn into a true believer, as a good pol as a oh, fuck as a good political economist, and a subject of private interest. The libertine will obey the imperative to wager, since he can gain infinitely more than he will lose. However, precisely at this point he is duped, for Pascal claims in another part of his fragment on wager that belief emerges from the repetition of senseless rituals. In order to become believers, we do not really need to believe, just as the libertine does not need to believe in order to wager. In fact, he only can wager as far as he does not believe, and through the repetition of wager in the moments of opposite temptation, he will be progressively transformed into a religious subject. For religion has no substantial essence. It is an entirely superficial compulsion to repeat. Pascal here surprisingly joins Freud, for whom compulsory action is obsessive neurosis, was the model of a religious ritual. The empty ritual finally reveals the true function of the master signifier. It is the imperative within the compulsory force, but its presence can also be revealed in the successful cohabitation of science and capitalism as formalized in the university discourse. The imperative keep on knowing that supports the regime of knowledge contains a double demand. Organize knowledge in such a way that it will serve for the production of subjects of capitalism and contribute to the stabilization of the economic other. In short, produce knowledge that will serve the market and the reproduction of capitalism. That everyone embarked upon the discourse of science simply means that everyone has been turned into a quantified subjectivity. Lacan emphasizes that in the university discourse, knowledge appears as all knowledge, not because it would know all, but because it is rooted in the foreclosure of negativity that supports its wholeness. University knowledge knows itself as knowledge and even claims to be nothing but knowledge. Stalinist bureaucracy, but also capitalist icracy, the rule of self-interest and of the strong ego. In Lacan's view, Western capitalism and Soviet communism developed two concurrent systems of power knowledge, an apparatus of commanding knowledge, in which the Stalinist bureaucrat, the capitalist expert in today's Eurocrat, behind the appearance of neutrality, embody the master that Lacan illustrates with a reference to the transcendental ego, an ego that would be identical with itself, and more precisely, the signifier, which would be its own signified. The myth of the ideal, um, one, or I? No, the myth of the ideal I, of the I that masters, of the I whereby at least something is identical to itself, namely the speaker, is very precisely what the university discourse is unable to eliminate from the place in which its truth is found. The master is the truth of the apparently neutral subject of cognition, and it is all the more understandable why Marx and Freud founded their sciences on the rejection of the ideal of cognition. The truth revealed in the university discourse is not simply that the master is split, but that it is reduced to the categorical imperative. Enjoy, work, know. These variations of sir of these variations of serve the system to which you owe your existence.